We're advancing into a future that's taking new shape every day. What will our world look like in 50 years? Fully automated cities and flying cars? Will our children have artificial organs? Will they live to be a hundred? Top international scientists look half a century ahead. Their discoveries will change the world. Fasten your seatbelts. This is the adventure of the future. When you think about the city of the future, we always imagine flying cars and ultra-modern architecture. But the real revolution in 50 years could be invisible. Consider this. When your parents were born, the PC didn't even exist. And today, every mobile phone has more memory than all the early computers. Now think 50 years out into the future, and you can begin to imagine the enormous possibilities for the city of the future. 50 years from now, a city of the future. It is afternoon. There are still schoolboys here, like 13-year-old Paul, but his route home is very different from that of today's kids. Hey, I'll race you to the hot dog stand. Go! Paul's holographic dolphin, the streets, the buildings, and everyone's clothes are constantly processing gigabytes of information. Hey, you cheated! You went through them, I saw it! The usual, please. Sure, Paul. The citizens of the city of the future are swimming in a 24-hour torrent of data. And that isn't the only big difference from today. What will a city in the West look like in the next 50 years? Let's do a little experiment. Go outside your front door and imagine that every 10th person is over 80 and every third person has reached the age of 60. Now, if you live outside the metropolitan areas, whole regions could be deserted. Now, why is this? Because outside of the United States, in the Western world, people are having fewer and fewer children. We're being hit by a double whammy, an aging population coupled with a declining birth rate. Quite simply, the birth rate is beginning to fall beneath the death rate. The aging society of the future may be a problem, but it could bring this advantage. It could ease the shortage of housing and jobs. Hi, Mom. Mm. Hi, honey. You're home early. How was school? Fine, thanks, Mom. Things still tense? Not for long. Hey, I'll see you tomorrow, honey. Bye, see you tomorrow. And don't spend all your time playing with that silly holofin. I won't, Mom. Taxi. This is Paul's grandpa, John. He's a computer freak and a first-generation hacker, and he's one of the few people in 2057 who still know what a keyboard and mouse look like. Asimo packing, not unpacking, I you idiot. Sorry. I said put it in. I need the blowtorch. Oh, hi, Gramps. Hi. Why don't you get the pile of junk and upgrade? Please this thing's so old, it's got no online connection. I can't get any upgrades anyway. It's probably time to track it. Here you go. Oh. Grandpa, why do you always eat hot dogs? Oh, what's wrong with hot dog? Oh, no. Please, Grandpa, not again. Sorry. This time I'm going for good. What did you argue about this time? I'm a bad influence, and I'm irresponsible. She happened to catch me putting the finishing touches to your new friend. You know what she says about that? How far have you got with it? It's finished. It's on your desk. To the annoyance of his mother, Paul's favorite game is playing with his virtual friends, who are barely distinguishable from reality. Well! Hello, Paul. You can talk. Yes. Well, come on, show me a few moves. With pleasure. These 3D images are more than just playmates. We will interact with them in hundreds of different ways through medicine, advertisements, Whoa. video games. Now, today's TV and computer monitors will seem as ancient to our grandchildren as the horse and buggy. In the future, these 3D images will no longer be confined to a traditional PC screen. Instead, they will leap out. They will jump, they will play, they will fly and float. We will interact with them 24 hours a day. But how close are we to that now? 
For 40 years, scientists all over the world have been trying to solve one tricky problem. How can you project freestanding 3D images in mid-air? We still don't have the final answer, but a team in California has made some remarkable progress. They project pictures onto a special layer of mist without a screen. Hey, Esmo, can you see me? It's different from uh, a normal display, a little, because on a fog screen, you can see both the front and the back of the projected yeah, picture. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Well, you look a little like a ghost. I can see it through you. Whenever uh, people actually see the fog screen, they reach in. When they see faces, uh, they get closer, they change the viewing angle. They just behave more lifelike. The fog screen is linked to four infrared cameras, so it can even react to a viewer's movements. Each camera constantly measures the distance from this cap to the infrared transmitter, so the computer can follow every movement of whoever's wearing the cap. OK, we can go ahead and start now. For the first test, the researchers have borrowed Paul's shark. It should follow Tobias Hollerer's movements. And so it does. The shark and the scientists seem to be invisibly linked. Tobias can steer the fish in the fog with neither mouse nor keyboard. But in daylight, this system doesn't work at all. So scientists are working on other ways to bring virtual worlds into the living room. And this may be the most remarkable technology yet created. It's developed by the Fraunhofer Heinrich Hertz Institute, a display that simulates 3D images. Special software creates two slightly different views of each image. Two different views are always needed for stereoscopic vision. If you can direct one to the left eye and one to the right eye, the brain will construct a 3D picture. But how can the two pictures simultaneously be directed to our left and right eyes? The solution is provided by this sheet of glass. Put it in front of a monitor and the sheet activates. You can see its special features under a magnifying glass. These simple regular grooves are central to the success of the system. Look at these very fine vertical stripes. It's as if we had set 600 lenses side by side on the display. And these lenses allow us to project the right picture into the right eye and the left picture into the left. The final stage is the alignment of the two cameras. They're observing Klaus Schenker's movements. The images are checked by software that's constantly analyzing the position of Schenker's eyes. The glass sheet in front of the monitor is mechanically moved to follow Klaus Schenker's eye movement. So his left eye always sees the picture for the left eye, and his right eye always sees the picture for the right eye. Next, an infrared sensor is installed that transmits every hand movement to the computer. Now everything's ready. A click in the air and a 3D picture is floating in front of Schenker's eyes. Our camera can't see it, so here it's simulated, but Schenker really can see it. They've already built displays that can be watched by up to eight viewers at once. So 3D TV is theoretically possible for the whole family. But it'll be decades before we can expect to see anything like Paul's shark swimming through our front room. The picture I can see now is not yet anywhere near as realistic as the one in Paul's room. For that, you would need a display that's actually invisible and could be viewed from every part of a room. We have yet to come up with the ideas that will let us achieve that. Wait a minute. Scientists expect that in 50 years, these virtual companions Whoa. really will speak to us. Jesus. If they were displayed on tethered or mobile balloons, they could even fill the skies. And that has given Paul a brilliant idea, to use a digital shortcut to plaster his shark onto all the display surfaces of the city. It won't be easy, even for the grandson of a hacker. The security experts of the big corporations have worked with the government 
to design highly effective digital defenses for the city of the future. Man, how come it always works for Grandpa? Let me out of here, Paul. Please. Oh, please. I know. Please. Please, Paul, please. Hey, buddy. What's up? I think this is how he does it. But even in the future, there will be no absolutely fail-safe systems. Professionals know where to look for the weak spots. Cool. I'm in. Whoa! At the same moment, Paul's mother is on her way to work on an underground highway. She's on night shift at police headquarters. She uses the driving time to check out the latest shoes at her favorite virtual boutique. Yes? Georgina, where are you? On my way. What's up? We got a problem. A bunch of data control systems have been sending error messages. We're working on it, but when are you going to be here? Computer says six minutes on subterranean auto drive. Good. See you then. Okay. Nobody's steering. 100 kilometers an hour on automatic pilot. Wouldn't it be great if you jumped into your car, told it where to go, and the car drove itself without your ever touching the steering wheel? Wouldn't it be great if there were billions of chips stored in the road, each costing a penny, eliminating traffic jams and even car accidents? Now, as ambitious as all this seems, this technology is coming. So get ready for the driving experience of your life. Not everyone will like it. Two-thirds of drivers enjoy speed, and they like their sense of freedom. That's all right if you're on a test track. But on a highway, instincts like that can get you into trouble. Wir haben allein in Deutschland noch über 5000 Unfalltote jährlich und das ist schlicht zu viel und das ist eine Motivation, die uns antreibt, diese Zahl immer weiter runterzubringen. The first step towards the autonomous automobile is the development of a system that will prevent collisions. This radar sensor will be developed into an electronic eye that can recognize almost any kind of obstacle. The car's brain is a set of computers packed into the trunk. From speed and distance data, it can calculate when a crash is imminent. It took a year to develop the software. Now it's time to try it out, with a collision trial on Audi's test track, well away from prior eyes. These foam blocks have a high metal content to make them visible to radar sensors. But only the car on the left is fitted with the sensors. Stop. The speed of the test is 30 kilometers an hour, and neither driver is allowed to break. The sensors of the car on the left are constantly measuring the distance to all possible obstacles. And this is the moment of truth. The computer has calculated that it is now no longer possible to avoid the blocks, so it immediately gives the signal to brake hard. Steel clamps steel, and without a single movement from the driver, the car stops just in front of the blocks. Test 2, 80 kilometers an hour. The sensor spots the obstacle, but it breaks too late. At this speed, the software can't decide if the driver hasn't seen the obstacle or simply intends to pull out to pass it. But that will soon change. Okay, we can lose one. Audi's experts are now doing some of the first in-depth research into the behavior of that little-known species, the driver. Infrared cameras record every move. They're looking for behavior patterns that will let the computer predict what the driver is going to do. The, next links. the onboard computer will watch everything the driver does, just like an instructor, and will only intervene if something goes wrong. The computer can already tell, just from the frequency of his blinking and the direction of his glance, how well a driver is concentrating and what he's concentrating on. But there's a long way to go before a computer can take full control of both car and driver. Ja, wenn wir den Mensch betrachten mit seinen Wahrnehmungsfähigkeiten, kann man auch sehr bescheiden werden. Um, wir sind in der Lage, völlig unbekannte Szenen sofort zu erkennen. Wir identifizieren sofort Menschen dort, wir identifizieren gefährliche Objekte, die Kollisionsobjekte werden können. Und dieses Ganze im Rechner nachzubilden, das ist eine große Kunst. 10.000 Kilometer further west, 
American scientists are attempting something even more radical. These are the first entirely driverless cars. Each car has eight kilometers of cables and wires linking steering wheel, accelerator and brake with cameras and a GPS system. And the most important part is the software they've been developing over the past six months. Well, for me, since I wrote the software, the biggest fear for me is that something I wrote dies for a silly reason. That is my biggest nightmare. In a few minutes, this car will be off on a 200 kilometer race organized by the U.S. Military Research Institute, DARPA. Spider, the car built by Cornell University, has done well in the qualifying rounds. But now, in the finals, this car must safely negotiate mountain passes and tunnels. The big favorite is Stanford University's Stanley. Once the race starts, all 23 cars are on their own. Steering wheels steer, but there's no one there. Only the world's media. Identifying obstacles, calculating sizes and distances, working out avoidance strategies. Humans do all this in fractions of a second. Spider has to work it out step by step. Whenever Spider moves, a warning signal sounds, because no one yet completely trusts its independent maneuvers. It makes a rather hesitant approach to the obstacle, but it does find the right way. Within an hour, Spider is out of action, like most of the other cars. 18 of the 23 vehicles suffer system failures. You wouldn't want to see one of these too close to a pedestrian crossing. But at the toughest part of the course, something really remarkable is happening. The favorite has managed to get over the mountain pass and is on its way to the finishing line. Four other cars follow behind. I really think that in the future we could easily have cars and trucks where the humans don't have to make any decisions, where that all of the human errors and everything like that that causes problems can be avoided, and I think we can get there in 50 years. On the intelligent streets of the future, the cars speed on while their passengers just take it easy. Meanwhile, Paul is amazed at his success. Wow, that's wild. It works. The shark is out hey, there. Hey, how is it up there? He's on a digital journey into the city center of the future. Screen by screen, the city turns into shark town. Buildings out of a biological microcosmos spiral into the sky. Parks and forests float at dizzying heights. Nature has taken over the city's architecture. But the greatest revolution is the invisible one. Billions of computer chips link hospitals, police, fire and railroad stations as inextricably as if they were the cells of a single living organism. In 50 years, the brain of the whole city could be a single, highly efficient nerve center, like a contemporary traffic control center, but its capabilities would be infinitely greater. In an emergency, the whole city can be run by computer. Power stations and railroads can be shut down. Cars can be remote controlled like toys. And the network is present in the smallest things. Everyone uses it every minute of the day. ID scan successful. Welcome, Mr. Skeely. Thank you. You can take over a taxi using your fingerprint and simultaneously log in to your home. Your friends will never again wait outside your front door because you're late getting back. What is your destination, please? 21 First Street. Thank you. Hi, it's me. Hi. I know, I'm a bit early. Doesn't matter. Just go in and make yourself at home. Yeah, I'll see you inside. See you. You will let the home of the future know who's allowed in and who isn't. The whole time, the streams of data are invisibly communicating. As soon as an authorized person comes in, a room is woken up by the central computer to cater to their needs. If you want, the bathroom floor weighs you. Or if this is the evening after an especially good dinner, it doesn't. Your favorite TV programs are ready to run, and the temperature and humidity levels are set exactly as you like them. 
the fridge has restocked itself after the weekend by contacting the supplier direct. Right now, the scanner is checking all the sell-by dates. If something's still missing, even this fridge can't anticipate sudden cravings, the online supermarket is always available. It'll deliver at any time of the day or night. There's no question that the network city will have its advantages. Just think, grocery shopping from your couch. Your intelligent clothing will call an ambulance in case of an emergency. The GPS system will locate free parking slots. Sounds good to me. But you know, all of this comes with a warning. As we become more dependent on technology, just remember, even in the future, computers can crash, technology can fail. The Achilles heel of tomorrow's megacities are the all-important data networks. According to the FBI, US police forces will have cyber action teams in 50 years. They'll be there to fight assaults on the information arteries of the city. Georgina Gator. Paul's mother is in charge nice of one of these us. units. So, Their special the responsibility to is to protect communication and transport networks. The underground. The train stopped moving 20 minutes ago. Two minutes ago, this happened. A traffic jam. Last time I saw something like that was uh, 20 years ago. So, do you like him? Let's see what he can do. Uh, he's... Where is he? It's totally crazy, Gramps. Uh... Oh, no, you can't do that. I need Did to bring him. Clip that thing on there. I'll take this with me after all. Oh, no, Grandpa, please! Oh, Polly. I'm not going away forever. I'll call you. Just as soon as I find somewhere to live, okay? Come on. No, I mean I need that laptop. Uh, oh, so that's why. No, Grandpa! Uh, yes. Uh, well, have I left anything else? No, I don't think so. Come on, Asimov. Let's go. I do recognize you. You are Paul. Okay. The rust bucket can stay. Just take it to the junkyard when it starts to get near nerves, okay? Good morning, Paul. Where is your shark? I have a new program. May I have this dance sidestep? At the same time, the situation in the Department for Essential Infrastructure is getting critical. The city's firewall is crumbling. We nearly had a disaster at the airport. The flight traffic management system is completely jammed, and the fire department's been called out 27 times on false alarm in the last hour alone. System's gone completely haywire. That's it. Red alert. Secure all public buildings. The high-tech city is demonstrating its vulnerability. When the stream of data dries up, the network world stops functioning. I'm looking for the senior commissioner for critical infrastructures. That's me, Georgina Gator. What can I do for you? Data security, CityCon. I would have called, but all our lines are crashing. It's a virus in the central CityCom system. But how is that possible? Well, actually, it shouldn't be possible. But somehow, the Red Devil got through anyway. What Red Devil? Haven't you seen it? No. Bring up the city on your display. In less than five hours since the shark was let out, he has spread like an epidemic over the whole of the city's network. This thing is the problem? Well, kind of. It's attached to a virus, which is scanning the entire city for displays and holograms for the shark to invade. There are millions of them, so it's clogging the whole network. We don't know who the hacker is, but we know how he got in. How? He got access via the internal system of the police department. But how is that possible? In the name of Georgina Gator. Home run, have to learn that. You can't even untie yourself. You're totally useless, you pathetic piece of junk. Automodus run, check neck, check shoulder joints, 
check camera one. Paul? Sweetie, put Gramps on the phone. What's wrong? Have you looked out the window today? Your grandfather hacked your shark into the sky. Exactly what he and I were fighting about this morning. And he did it using my internal server access. Mom, the... I... Paul, sweetie, he's got to turn himself in. Now get him on the phone. Mom, he left because of your argument. Paul? Huh? Mom, he left? Paul! As the last means of communication break down, Georgina is left with only one choice. Everybody, listen up. We're initiating a citywide search. This is our man. His name is John Gator, my father. He's one of those old school hackers. He once did eight years in prison for hacking into the medical insurer's database. He nearly wiped it out. He was trying to stop a genetic census. Look, he tried to do a lot of things, but he never succeeded. Screen on. Screen on. I have to hurry. I don't know how long the secure link will last. Guys, I think I've found something big. This virus is running on 50-year-old code. It has attacked the ancient base layer of the city's operating system. We've got our best people working on it, but I don't know what's going to happen. I think we should prepare for the worst. Screen off. When people think about terrorism, they imagine dirty bombs and biological weapons. But for a crisis expert, there's a new type of threat that's just as catastrophic, and that's computer hacking. And one dangerous form is called social hacking. That's when someone gains access to a corporate or government computer using a password taken from a friend or a relative. From that vantage point, they can paralyze a modern city. They can disrupt water, food, transportation, electricity, and they can collapse the entire economy. Grandpa! Polly, over here! Grandpa! Grandpa! That's your shark. Grant, need a help? What? I use your old trick, and then I just attached it to the shark. So we could fly across With the... my old vial? Grant, Mom thinks it was you. They're looking for you. Grant, please help me. Paul, you didn't go online using your own computer, did you? Yes. You know, they'll find your data on the system just as soon as they reboot it. Can you fix it? You've crashed the entire network. To fix it, I'd have to access the Central City server. They've got more security than the Pentagon. There's only one thing we can do. Come on. One after another, the city's data networks are collapsing. Only the high security services are being virus free. The entire city Some is main shut networks down. like we hospitals and police the have their nobody own sophisticated in, protection systems. John Gator's it's the gotta last be found. He's in the middle of the town. A kind of life find insurance him and find for him a city now. depends on data flow. Bring him in safely. Is that clear? Meanwhile. Georgina is doing everything she can to find her father. Uh, mixture of satellite and terrestrial cameras, okay? Okay, start with the outskirts. And go. At the press of a button, hundreds of thousands of eyes are observing the city of the future. Nations around the world are installing millions of surveillance cameras to protect their citizens. And Great Britain is leading the way with 4.2 million surveillance cameras that can photograph each citizen 300 times a day. Now, that may sound excessive, but public acceptance rises every time they capture a terrorist or a child abductor. Now, these cameras have limitations. They can basically record, but they cannot identify. That's why computer scientists are now building the next generation of intelligent camera surveillance systems. One of the most powerful surveillance technologies of the future is currently under development in London. It's already the most closely monitored city in the world. Now these cameras are to learn to see intelligently. The scientists have connected Hello? them to revolutionary Hello? new software. Hi, my friend. I can hear you. 
Okay, can you see the cameras? They are around. The system has to tail this man like a detective. Okay, okay. Big Brother is stirring. You can go now. The first test involves just one camera. The software checks the live pictures every second for moving objects or people. When the computer has zeroed in on the test person, it must keep the camera trained on him and even predict his movements. Ah, here is. We track him. It will take into account his size, speed, and direction of movement. The system functions extremely well. The software follows the person exactly as planned. The red box shows where the person is at this moment, and the black box predicts where he will be a second from now. And you can't shake off the system just by moving out of sight of a camera. The scientists are already linking the cameras in the first networks. They'll be hunting together in packs. Okay, James, can you start it now? Thank you. If everything goes as planned, the camera network will keep a man in its sights. When he goes out of range on the first camera, he will disappear into the blind spot he built into the system. Then the second camera is going to pick him up and identify him by his size and direction of movement. Τις απόστασεις μεταξύ των δύο καμερών ή του μέσου χρόνου μετάβασης και μετά η τρίτη κάμερα θα μπορεί να παρακολουθήσει επιτυχώς το βοηθό μας μέχρι το τέλος. This test is the basis for a system that should in future be able to track down any person in the city. Camera one sees the person and gives him the identification number two. The next camera identifies the same man as number two. But camera three makes a mistake, and there's a simple reason for that. The only sure way to recognize people is by their faces, and today's two-dimensional cameras are often not up to the job. Even human beings have trouble identifying the same person on photos taken from different angles. A computer has no chance at all, except in ideal conditions. With a 2D photo, several factors make a positive identification virtually impossible. If we look at this picture here, we see that it's taken from a high angle and is strongly lit from the side. This picture up here is taken from a low angle and is lit even more strongly from the side, so it's very difficult to compare the two pictures. The team have been working on a 3D face recognition system for three years. It started with measurements of classical statues. It could soon be a way of checking up on our every move. It's a new form of surveillance. The cameras in this system project a striped grid on top of the recorded TV picture and send the combination to Henning Daum's computer. Seconds later, Julia Meyer is in the data bank, along with a 3D model of her face. Now, this device has to recognize Julia Meyer again. To make things more difficult, they switch the light off. Henning Daum explains what's happening inside. This is a normal 2D picture, in which you can see the whole face. But we just need the depth measurements of the face, the distance of each part of the face from the camera. It's like a mask on which the face is displayed in three dimensions. If a mask in your computer and a newly recorded mask fit together well, it's the same person. If they don't, it's two different people. Here, the reference image has been checked, and Miss Meyer was recognized perfectly. Die Frau Meier wurde perfekt erkannt. Under laboratory conditions, this system recognizes faces with almost 100% accuracy. Now, the researchers want to prepare the system to put it on the street and install it over entire cities. In 50 years, we'll no longer be working with visible light. It'll be invisible. The grid will no longer be stripes, but rings. The whole thing will be integrated into the camera, so the camera itself will make the 3D images. And Georgina could use a network of cameras like this to search for her father. Bingo! 
Milo Drive, Commissioner. Heading north. Where's he going? Can you make a prediction? System program predicts. Destination is... Oh! Municipal Archives. Where's she going? A few kilometers away, near the city comp, John has been searching for hours for a way to hack into the city's central computer. But now, the virus has blocked the digital arteries of the city. John's last maps. hope Medium is the central slower. archive. What kind of maps do you need? I need the data from the old city administration now. What data? Do the original maps still exist? We have something even better. Yeah, maps, maps. Come with me. How many CDs do you have containing music and video? Well, I hate to tell you this, but in the future, much of that information could become unreadable because your computer is obsolete. Now, if you think you have lots of important data, just think of the national archives and libraries of the world. Now, there is a solution to the problem. Holographic crystals can store up to 200 DVDs worth of information for a thousand years, either as digits or as microscopic images. This means that you could read the data even without a computer. Many scientists have gone there even further. Are. They're working on data crystals that will store especially important information in a form that you can read by the light of a candle, the same way you project a transparency onto a wall. However, most crystals today can only be read by a laser. There it is. I know it. Is that the main computer glimpse? Not quite, my boy, not quite. We'll never get in there, but this is the next best thing. Dad, oh, do no. you have any idea what you've done? I'm going to lose my job, and you're going back to jail. Yeah, but Mom, I was me. Gramps had nothing to do with it. Oh, you just stay out of it. No, this. Mom, it's true. But Gramps can fix it. We have to manipulate the main computer. Paul's identification data is still on it. I'm hoping to get access using a little detour. You mean to tell me that a 13-year-old boy did this? Yes. Well, he did use my technology. Okay, split up. Go. Go, go. Georgina, focus. We have to get out of here and fix this thing before it's too late. No, you fix it. Paul stays with me. No, Mom, we both have to go. I know the new computer's better. Okay, go. What do you want me to do? Keep him here. Stall him. How much time do you need? I don't know. I must have just missed him. The entrance has to be around here somewhere. Here, that's it. It has to be. It's locked. Shoot. Oh, shoot. I've got everything here but the blowtorch. Maybe it's in here. No, that's clothes. Hello, Paul. I do recognize you. I have seen your shark everywhere. Save. At the last minute, John's personal robot has brought the urgently needed tool, as if he could read John's mind. This could be science fiction. Okay, drop it off. Good boy. You are welcome. We've seen movies like Star Wars and iRobot, films with fantastic robots, companions with far superior intellect and strength. So. Where have all the cool robots gone? I mean, look at Asimo. Slow, clunky, can barely deliver a blowtorch. And even those behaviors would require new breakthroughs in human-like sensing and decision-making and thinking. Now, progress in this field will be slow for the next 50 years. But don't get me wrong, there will be breakthroughs. But just don't expect that any Asimo-like robot will be babysitting your grandchildren. Asimo was a special challenge for his engineers right from the beginning. This was a 10-year project, a dream to build the best humanoid robot in the world. The 
the toughest nut to crack was simply walking upright. Today, he makes it look easy, but for a long time, it seemed like an insoluble problem. The story of this mechanized biped goes back 20 years. Back then, he took 30 seconds for a single step. Our sense of balance, calling for complete coordination of feet, knees and hips, turned out to be extremely complex. But his creators didn't give up. By 1996, Asimo was on his feet. The first two-footed machine in history went for a walk. Today, Asimo is almost as steady on his feet as a human being. His balance system even lets him turn and shift his weight. And he even has his advanced locomotion certificate. He can climb the stairs. It looks great, but Asimo can't make any of these movements independently. Each step is programmed, otherwise he'd fall. Today's robots are programmed for a specific situation and for a specific task. Good morning. How do you feel? I'm feeling great. Thank you. Let's shake hands. The programmer mustn't change a single word in his sentences. Even the distance between the scientist and the robot must be right if the robot is to respond. Okay, let's shake hands. If the environment changes or the activity takes place in another context, these robots are helpless. Go where I am pointing. I'm not sure where you're pointing. Go where I am pointing. Where shall I go? I know you. Pascal. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> go where I am pointing. I'm not sure where you're pointing. Okay. Let's shake hands. Thus we need simple, flexible systems able to learn from experience. So it's time for Asimo's training platform to go to school. Asimo has to learn something very basic. How to learn. It's essential if he's ever to cope with unfamiliar situations. This is a lesson about new objects. Apple. Okay, did you say apple? Yes, this is correct. Okay. Man in the moon. Okay. Hairbrush. Okay. Once again, human beings okay. are the model for the new learning software. Asimo learns the same way small children store new objects in their brains. Please show something. Please show something. Now, Asimo quickly recognizes objects he's learned about. Airbrush. Baby man in the moon. Man in the moon. Please show something. Unknown object. Teddy bear. Did you say teddy bear? Yes, this is correct. Okay. Please show something. He's very good at storing new information and he can retrieve it when it's needed. Teddy bear. Yes, this is correct. Now comes a more difficult test. And this is the first time it's been filmed. Today, Asimo will be asked to act independently. The researchers have set him a tiny task, but they haven't fully programmed his response. They've left him a little freedom of action. We have given our robot the task of picking up a bottle, and he has four possible ways of carrying it out. Asimo has been trained with this green bottle, like a dog with a stick. As soon as the robot spots the object of his desires, he approaches it movement by movement. Each millisecond, he makes new calculations about the best way to get to the bottle. If he can't reach it with the left hand, he tries the right. Our robot isn't programmed, and he isn't carrying out any pre-programmed movements. We set the goal, and he develops the movements all by himself to pursue this goal. During these simple movements, 
highly complex programs are running in Asimov's computer brain. He must see, calculate distances and positions, and know what he should concentrate on. At the same time, he must pass on the results of his calculations to the joints of his body, and then make a sensible, effective movement, something we humans do without much thought, all our waking hours. Of course, this is just the beginning of flexible, interactive behavior. If we want to achieve more complex behavior, like going shopping in a supermarket, crossing the street, or helping a human being, then this robot will have to have a much greater number of behavioral options to choose from. And looking forward 20, 30, or maybe even 50 years, he mustn't just wait for instructions. He must be able to analyze problems for himself and be at man's beck and call as a supporting machine. It's close. Come on, let's go. John and Paul have almost reached their destination. This used to be the digital heart of the city, before technological progress left it far behind. Oh, Gramps, what is this place? Uh, over there is the old city information headquarters. When they built a new one, they closed this one down, but it's still connected to the central computer. Who would have thought that Azimuth be the only piece of technology to survive my virus? Think about it. No online connection, no data, no virus. Thanks, pal. Keep moving. We haven't got much time. Keep going. First of all, we have to let the central computer know that this place is back in control. What is that? Mouse. A what? Mouse. What's it for? Okay, just let me do it. You have to go to SC Systems. I know. SC, there's I know. food. I know, I know. Slash. Old technology needs update. John works feverishly to extinguish the identification data his grandson left at the scene of the digital crime. Okay, Paul, you're safe. I erased your identification data. Okay, now what? <laughs> No, 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 no. What happened? I think I just corrupted the entire electrical supply. Well, why do you do that? Well, it wasn't deliberate. To run the antivirus program, I had to find a non-infected network, which was still clean. And then I had not to... Not anymore. Not anymore. OK, let me do it. Gramps, I know how to fix it. You have to go to the inner core program. Yeah, that's good. Get it, Georgie. It should have worked. Hey, look over there! Release him. He's not our guy. In fact, he's just saved the whole city. Paul Edward Gator. 
get over here. No more sharks. Stick to dolphins. <laughs> Why bother to predict the future if there's a rule of thumb that everything comes out differently anyway? Well, I'll tell you why. Predictions of the past were way off because we didn't understand the laws of nature. Well, today we have the atomic theory of chemistry. We have the quantum theory of physics. And we have the DNA theory of biology. So our predictions can be more accurate. Now, of course, we're still going to make huge blunders. But in my opinion, it's better to walk in a forest with foggy glasses than to be totally blind. Mm -hmm.